My name is Kevin Regick, and I welcome you to my channel, Conversations from the Hot Box. Here we are passionate about discussing real life issues, and I do so from a Christian biblical perspective. I believe that by sharing our experiences and insights, we can learn from one another and grow in our faith and understanding of God's word. Today's conversation is part two of a reply to the bishop. It addresses the controversy surrounding comments from Bishop Clarence McClendon regarding Pastor Jamal Bryan and Vice President Kamala Harris. So let's ride. Unlike Donald Trump, I don't believe people who disagree with me are the enemy. He wants to put them in jail. I'll give them a seat at the table. My next guest is the granddaughter of the famous Reverend Billy Graham, and she is also endorsing Kamala Harris. She writes this in a recent op-ed, quote, Trump's words and actions are fundamentally incompatible with evangelical principles, and goes on to say, for Harris, assuming the Oval Office isn't about prestige or avoiding criminal prosecution, it's an opportunity to serve. Trump, on the other hand, spews apocalyptic nonsense that serves only to demonize others and divide America. The author, Jerusha Dufour, joins me now. Uh, thank you so much uh, for being here. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us to explain your views. Uh, can I just start Hello. with, um, you know, I read the opinion piece you wrote uh, in Newsweek, and you use, you know, language, the language of Christianity, which you clearly speak very fluently and matters a lot to you, uh, to try to talk to these voters about why uh, you are opposing uh, former President Trump, and obviously many of them are with Trump, if not most of them. Uh, what do you say to them now uh, here in the final week? You know, the fact, the reality that my opinion here is unique is shocking and heartbreaking, right? I mean, look at what happened on Sunday night. Um, we're talking about basic principles of our faith, kindness, um, gentleness, humility. These aren't, you know, theological things that I would have learned in Bible school. This is basic tenets of our faith. Um, and this president has shown since 2016 that he doesn't represent any of those things. So the fact that I even have to say these things is, um, is discouraging, to be honest with you. Uh, can I ask you, I mean, you, you mentioned your vote is one that's really against Donald Trump, and obviously abortion has been front and center in yeah. this campaign. Uh, yeah. The fall of, of Roe versus Wade is something that a lot of evangelical voters uh, had hoped, had prayed for. Uh, how do you square uh, what your beliefs may be, what are your beliefs on that with your vote here? Sure, absolutely. I think what I would ask a lot of people to do is ask what pro-life means to them, right? What is the definition of pro-life for them? Um, for me, pro-life is, you know, womb to grave. So to support a baby in the womb, but also support um, people being labeled as human garbage um, doesn't really seem to line up for me, right? And so can we support life all the way through life? Um, also the statistics. I ask people to look at the statistics and see that um, about 8% abortions went up about 8% under, under Donald Trump. Um, so I'm not really sure either party is pro-life. I try to look at which one is more pro-family and I think that's more Kamala Harris's uh, administration. Really fascinating perspective. Uh, Drusha DeFord, I'm uh, so grateful to have you on the show. Thank you very much for being here. One of the expectations of a spiritual leader is to sound the alarm when the community is in danger. Sounding the alarm in spite of the belief you may not be personally in danger, but the community you are called to serve is. And this is not a one issue responsibility. In other words, because there is agreement on one issue where the danger is coming from, but discord on many other issues, there is no alarm sound because they have agreement on one issue. And I'm talking about the issue of abortion. It appears the mindset of many Christians is that as long as you're against abortion, you have my support. In fact, all one has to do is say that they're against abortion. And I don't think this is the mindset God intended Christians to have. 
a one issue mindset. The bishop was not sounding the alarm. Uh, he was actually hindering it. People who have worked closely with uh, ex-president Trump for years, and even some of his family, have been telling us how dangerous Trump is. Check this Chief out. Chief Washington Correspondent John Carl. John, let's go back to those comments from retired General John uh, Kelly. One of the things you've reported in your books, I report in my book as well. We've seen it again today. Some of the most damning critiques of Donald Trump's character and competence come from those who serve in these top national security positions. I'll go further than that, George. The most damning critiques of Donald Trump and the most dire warnings about what it would mean if he came back into the White House came from people who served him closest in his administration in the most sensitive and important positions. Let me just go through a few of them. I've, I've written them down so that I don't leave any out, but I'm going to leave some out because there are a lot. Obviously, there's his former vice president. There's Rex Tillerson, who was his secretary of state, Bill Barr, who was attorney general, John Kelly, Mark Milley, Mark Esper, who was his defense secretary, Jim Mattis, who was his earlier defense secretary, Dan Coats, who was in charge of the uh, national intelligence. All of these people have come out to issue dire warnings about Donald Trump. And George, it, I have to say, it's not just the people that have come out publicly, a lot of others, and you can see them in that they are not endorsing Trump, but they're not speaking publicly. They're worried about the feedback. Let me just read you something that an anonymous, very top official who spent every day time with Donald Trump, served more than a year's administration, told me uh, about Donald Trump. Trump lacks any shred of human decency, humility, or caring. He is a traitor and a malignancy in our nation and represents a clear and present danger to our democracy and rule of law. Again, that is somebody who, just like John Kelly, who was with Trump every day for more than a year in the White House. Traitor. Let's put that graphic back up there, because I, I, I want to make a point here. When you see that graphic of all the people who surrounded Donald Trump, these are the people that were in the Situation Room during the times of crisis. If Donald Trump is election again, none of those people will be there. Well, I've, I've spoken to Trump many times about some of these people that have crossed him, and I asked him what his next administration would be like. What he's told me is he didn't know anybody. He had to rely on advice to hire people last time. Now he knows people. He will put people in who are loyal to him. Uh, he will put people in that will carry out his orders. The guardrails will be gone. Yeah. John Carl, thanks very much. Now, according to biblical perspectives, Christians should actively address various social issues. The Bible teaches a strong emphasis on social justice and caring for the vulnerable, meaning they have a moral responsibility to engage with problems like poverty, inequality, uh, 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 the undereducated, the injustice within their communities. And this is often, often seen as an outworking of their faith and their love for God and others. It's not limited to abortion. The Bible contains numerous verses that encourage us as Christians to help the marginalized, to fight for justice and care for the poor. Like the teachings of Jesus Christ and the prophets. Now this should be done when addressing social issues. Christians should prioritize respectful dialogue and avoid divisive tactics. God has special concern for three groups of people, according to scripture, foreigners, widows, and orphans. We see that in Exodus, Exodus chapter 22, verses 21 to 24. Now ask yourself, do you honestly hear Trump express any heartfelt concern for any of these groups? I cannot wrap my head around the support of religious people to this particular individual based on Christian principle. Now, why didn't we see the same outrage, for example, uh, regarding the acts and speech of Mr. Trump, as opposed to the outrage the bishop shown regarding Pastor Jamal Bryant having Vice President Harris at his church. Mr. Trump, uh, a man who 
started and is still declaring the lie that the prior election was stolen. A man who is causing a whole community of legal, law-abiding Haitians to be attacked. A man who recently at a rally in New York City uh, spewed so much hate it was referred to as a Nazi gathering. A man who uses religion to manipulate not to stand and, and, and shape and form his life. A man who has shown himself to be a racist, an adulterer, and a liar. A man who has encouraged his followers and other religious leaders, such as the bishop, to demonize a political rival and a whole group of people called Democrats. It's, it's, it's just amazing, mind-blowing to me that you would actually allow division to be birthed in your church, because I'm sure everybody in your church are not mega Republicans or Republicans or progressives or Democrats, but you're attacking demonization of Democrats. You're causing a divide in your own church and in the body of Christ as a leader. Anyway. Christians should not call other people demons, even if they disagree with their beliefs or actions. This is considered inappropriate and it goes against the core Christian teachings of love, compassion, and judging, judging others with clarity. Labeling someone a demon is a severe accusation that should only be reserved for uh, spiritual entities, not other human beings. Yes, you can. We, we, we can identify when demonic forces may be working in an individual's life, but that doesn't mean that individual is a demon. When John calls believers to test the spirits in 1 John 4 and 1, he is urging them to compare every teaching or impulse that emerges in an individual or the world against the truth of the gospel. That Jesus Christ is the Son of God, sent to be the Savior of all who believe. We should remember that demons are constantly pursuing the deception and destruction of people by turning them away from Jesus. And one way to do that is to cause discord in the very body of Christ. So we should be watchful, not only watchful, very watchful and discerning. I have not heard one statement from Vice President Harris encouraging any Christian to turn their back on Jesus. I find it amazing how Christian leaders want to demonize Vice President Harris and the Democrats, but completely disregard Mr. Trump's and, and, and his followers' many sins and crimes. Not to mention that he intends what he intends to do if reelected according to the 2025 project. And honestly, Bishop, maybe you should read Project 2025. All of this is insane to me. Uh, it's crazy how anyone could sit here and condemn a church for hosting Vice President Harris, but praise those who host Trump. And please allow me to challenge you to do some research and, and pray for discernment. Do some research on what is known as the Great Switch. This will thoroughly explain why certain people vote the way they do. Just to give you a few highlights, the, the, the Great Switch highlights that prior to the Civil, Civil Rights Act of 1964, many white conservative Christians were Southern uh, Democrats. When President Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act in 1964, 
and the Civil Rights Voting Act in 1965, many Southern Democrats, uh, such as the racist governor of South Carolina at the time, Mr. Thurman, left the Democratic Party to join, join the Republican Party and many like-minded people followed. And Blacks moved to the Democratic Party from the Republican Party. Afterwards, every Republican that tried to run for president were opposed to the Civil Rights Act and tried to segregate America again. Sound familiar? But by, 19, by the 1980s, all Southern states were now Republican states. And these are the same racist conservative Christians that was once in the Democratic Party of the South. The majority of African Americans don't vote in favor of Christian morals as a priority. Let's just keep it. We vote according to what we think will benefit us as African Americans. And just because we are Christians doesn't mean we're in favor of everything our party represents, be it Democratic, Republican, Progressive, whatever. So it's important that we educate ourselves before we start to berate each other. Before you start spewing hate because someone decides to vote and have a different political view than yours. I hear many Christians say they uh, they vote their faith. I also hear many Christians say that they don't vote. Well, that's not biblical. As Christians, we have a responsibility and an accountability to because it's our due diligence as citizens to vote. And those that say that they vote their faith. That can be very challenging in a country where the political makeup is not based on religious faith. However, the Bible tells believers to test spirits by the spirit. Now, under this wisdom, one of the things I listen for when I'm meeting individuals for the first time who say that they are Christians, I'm listening to see if they, one, confess Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and the confession of their sins. Why? Because how can you accept saving grace if you don't acknowledge you need saving? Or how can you submit to someone as Lord if you feel you got your life together and therefore don't need any guidance? Like someone who states that they're just the greatest at everything, the best at everything, and almost every and anything that is mentioned to them. <laughs> Yet, the individual many Christians proclaim as God's chosen for this hour has stated that he doesn't feel the need to repent of his sins. Yes, the bishop supports a man who said on national television he doesn't need forgiveness but yet you persecute Vice President Harris for addressing a heckler. Listen for yourself. So we've got people lined up for questions. I just got one more, because you used the word Christian. Have you ever asked God for forgiveness? That's a tough question. I, I don't think in terms of, I have, I'm, I'm a religious person. Shockingly, because people are so shocked when they find this out. Uh, I'm Protestant, I'm Presbyterian. And I go to church and I love God and I love my church. And Norman Vincent Peale, the great Norman Vincent Peale was my pastor. The power of positive thinking. Everybody's heard of Norman Vincent Peale. He was so great. He would give a sermon. You never wanted to leave. Sometimes we have sermons and every once in a while we think about leaving a little early, right? Even though we're Christian. <laughs> Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, Frank, would give a, survey, would give a sermon. I'm telling you, I still remember his sermons. It was unbelievable. And what he would do is he'd bring real life situations, modern day situations into the sermon. And you could listen to him all day long. When you left the church, you were disappointed that it was over. He was the greatest guy. And then 
you know, he passed away, but he was a great, the, the, he wrote The Power of Positive Thinking, which is but, a great book. But have you ever asked God for forgiveness? <laughs> I'm not sure I have. I just go and try and do a better job from there. I don't think so. I think I, if I, if I do something wrong, I think I just try and make it right. I don't bring God into that picture. I don't. Now, when I take, you know, when we go in church and, and when I drink my little wine, which is about the only wine I drink, and have my little cracker, I guess that's a form of asking for forgiveness. And I do that as often as possible because I feel cleansed, okay? But, uh, you know, to me, that's important. I do that. But in terms of officially, I should, I'd see, I could say absolutely. And everybody, I don't think in terms of that. I, I think in terms of let's go on and let's make it right. Mr. Trump says he never asked for forgiveness of his sins. In other words, he has never repented and doesn't feel it's important. If he believed it was important, he would do so like most Christians. Repentance is a fundamental concept in religious and spiritual context, involving a change of mind, heart, and behavior towards sin and God. It encompasses intellectual, emotional, and, and, and volatile elements. Intellectually, repentance requires recognizing one's sinfulness and acknowledging the need for forgiveness. Emotionally, it involves sincere sorrow and remorse. Repentance demands a change in direction, abandoning disobedience and surrendering to God's will. Now, this process is often uh, described as a turning away from sin towards righteousness. Now, some sources emphasize that true repentance is not merely feeling sorry, but must result in observable uh, changes in behavior. Repentance is considered essential for salvation and most religious traditions and is viewed as a central message that the church should bring to the world. And while human beings are responsible for repenting, some beliefs hold that the uh, 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 ability to truly repent is a gift from God. In the book of Acts chapter 3 verse 19 it says, So repent, change your mind and purpose. Turn around and return to God, that your sins may be erased, blotted out, wiped clean, at times of refreshing, of recovering from the effects of heat, of, of reviving with fresh air, that those times may come from the presence of the Lord. Finally, let's, let's get to the bottom line. According to a LifeWay research study, 71% of evangelical Christians believe there is a moral decline in our country because too many laws legislating morality have been struck down. This means that there are followers of Christ who believe, at least to some extent, that laws regulating moral behavior are the best ways to produce morality in people and in society. This position is troublesome because it misses the foundational truth of Christianity. Moral works aren't enough to save us from the penalty for our sins or to restore our relationship with God. Rather, repentance and faith in Christ grants us forgiveness relationship with God produces a godly lifestyle in us as Jesus works on our heart through the Holy Spirit and his word. Now here's why legislating morality isn't effective and why uh, the way of Jesus and Christianity itself is bad. Legislating morality doesn't actually change people. <laughs> it just makes them look like they're changed. As Christians, we have to ask, what are we really after? Do we want people to just look like they're changed by Jesus? Or do we want people to actually be changed by Jesus? 
actually an encounter uh, the circumcision of the heart. Do we want to encourage people unintentionally to have a form of godliness but reject the power of Christ that actually transformed their lives? The Bible teaches that faith in Jesus precedes following the commands of Jesus. The Bible also teaches that holiness, morality, is something that Jesus works in our lives from the inside out, not the other way around. Read Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 and Ephesians chapter 4. You know, God, God doesn't look at the outward appearance, but at the heart. If the outward appearance is going to be right, the heart has to be right first. God does not care about the outward. He does care about our actions and the kind of lives we live. But a heart can't become righteous through external imposed regulations, laws, and rules. A heart can only become righteous through the transforming work of Christ, through the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Then a righteous lifestyle will overflow out of a heart that is growing in righteousness as a person walks with Christ. The Constitution of the United States affords rights to all citizens of our nation of free speech, freedom of the press, freedom to practice their respective faiths or not practice any faith at all. Now, these rights uh, uh, don't only apply to Christians. And by the way, some Christians react to people doing and saying things that are different from their Christian beliefs in a way that is not pleasing to God. And actually, you wouldn't know that they are Christians by their actions and their words. People have a right to live in ways uh, 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 we may disagree with as Christians. Our job and responsibility is to share our testimony, share the gospel uh, with them, and then move on. You know, it, it doesn't mean that it's over just because your job was finished. See, uh, scripture tells us, maybe my job is just to dig the ground. Your job is to come and plant the seeds. Somebody else's job is to cover the seeds with dirt. Somebody else's job is to water uh, the area where the seeds are planted. But it is God that gives the increase, not you and I, not regulations. And yes, there are eternal consequences for unrepentant sins against God. And yes, God wants every person to repent of their sins and be saved. Every person, however, has to respond to God's call by their own choice. Read Acts 17, 30 and 31. Jesus rejected political influence when he was on this earth because that was not his chosen method to further his kingdom in the world. He explicitly said that his kingdom is not an earthly one in John 18, 36. And when people tried to make him a king, <laughs> he just left. Jesus taught us to preach the gospel to every person in the power of the Holy Spirit and teach believers to obey the things he commanded. That's how people come to faith in Christ and grow in faith in Christ. It doesn't happen through Christian uh, morals having political influence. Laws, rules, and regulations are not God's primary method of producing morality and change in people. The kingdom of God is not furthered through earthly political systems. God's kingdom is formed in the hearts of people as they believe in his gospel, believe in his son, repent of their sins, and turn uh, from their ways with the help 
leading, guiding, and directing of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus returns, he will establish a physical kingdom on this earth forever. A kingdom filled with God's righteousness. Legislating morality pushes people away from Christ. People can't genuinely uh, come to know Jesus when they're pressured. And that's the whole reason God created us with free will. So we can freely choose to come to him and love him because he first loved us. When we use political uh, policy and influence to try to get people to live out Christian morality, again, it only pushes people to resent and reject Christ. So in conclusion, as Christian followers, we need to be less concerned with whether our faith has the most influence in Washington, D.C., and more concerned about walking in our calling to be witnesses and preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ to this world through the power of the Holy Spirit. Only then will we truly partner with Jesus to tell people about him and, and see them brought into his marvelous light and the family of God. What say you? Well, I hope you enjoyed the ride today. Uh, please take a second to, to hit the subscribe button uh, and the notification button so that you can be informed of more types of content. And also like us and revisit our channel. Now, if you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, click on the button above labeled Prayer of Salvation or in the link in the description section below. Otherwise, I want to thank you again for spending some of your time with me. Please uh, take a second to consider all that you heard. Pray about it. And as always, peace and blessings to you and your household.